Hello, good evening everybody and greetings. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us tonight and have been able to join us for this um, online seminar. I'm Susan Zeiger, I'm a program director here at Primary Source and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our Primary Source online seminar series for spring 2019. Latin America and the Caribbean Today, Topics for the Classroom. This is the third and final session of our series, and tonight we'll have a chance to examine the very recent history of democratic governance in Latin America, asking questions like, what is the state of democracies in the region today? And also, what are we really talking about when we talk about democracy anyway? Our presenter for this topic is Professor Amy Risley. Uh, she's a scholar of comparative politics and Latin American studies from Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, good evening, Amy. It's so nice to have you with us and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Sure, we're really delighted and so looking forward to it. So I'm going to introduce Amy more fully in a few moments. Um, but for now, let's just say that the question of democracy um, in the area of research that uh, Amy works in is one of perennial interest for those who study this region because of its recent history, the, the re recent history, political history of the region, um, also earlier historical legacies of conquest, authoritarian government, and so forth. One clear reason why this was a choice um, of topic when we were thinking of what our three topics would be for the series. We also thought that it was timely because of the renewed interest in Massachusetts and elsewhere in the country in teaching civics and helping make our students more civically engaged and civically knowledgeable. And at Primary Source, we work hard to, um, to encourage educators and schools to think about global um, approaches to understanding the political and civic realm as well as those that are national in focus. So this seemed like a great opportunity to bring in a comparison of lens on thinking about democracy. There are also wonderful tie-ins to news media as a global issue and we're excited um, to work with, with those materials tonight. And I'll talk about that toward the end of our evening together. And finally, we often look for opportunities to work with social scientists from other disciplines, non-historians. And it's really exciting to have someone steeped in the disciplinary tools of um, political science with us tonight, a live political scientist. So um, Amy uh, will, will share with us some charts and data and quantitative analysis and studies, which she combines very thoughtfully in her work with study of human, um, human stories in the political realm. So I think it's going to be a great session and we're really looking forward to it. Before we launch this evening, I would just a couple of brief housekeeping matters. So um, we will just review where we've been and where we're going. Um, so this again was the a webinar, our webinar series for this spring. We started with environmental issues in Latin America and the Caribbean. L two weeks ago, we had a really exciting session on um, the drug wars um, and uh, migration and the involvement of states and um, foreign powers um, and national governments in the, those border issues with Professor Jorge Capatillo. And then tonight is the third and final in the series. And I wanted to mention this and remind you that um, all three of these sessions will be available um, on our YouTube page. The first two are already there and this session tonight will be recorded and joining it so you can refer back to it and share the link with colleagues who might be interested in the topic as well. Later in the hour tonight, we'll have a designated block of time for your questions and comments. And I encourage you to begin entering your questions as they occur to you. You can use the questions chat box um, in the control panel on the right and type in um, what you'd like to know. And I'll be monitoring that and sharing those questions with Amy. We're gonna have a really great um, Q&A session tonight, I think, and, and lots of interesting things to talk about. Uh, also, as we're we're 
moving ahead. A word about our organization. We are a not-for-profit organization that partners with educators to bring global learning into K-12 classrooms and schools. This is our anniversary year. We're 30 years old. This is a big milestone for us. The heart of our work is providing professional development for K-12 teachers uh, and supporting them in um, their um, their their global teaching. We invite you to learn more about us at www.primarysource.org. And I'll close out this evening by sharing some easy ways that you can stay connected with us and the work we do. And now I'd like to turn our attention to our webinar topic for the night and introduce you to our webinar speaker. Again, I'm so pleased that we're joined this evening by Professor Amy Risley. Amy is Associate Professor and currently Chair of International Studies at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, where she teaches a wide array of courses about Latin American politics and social movements. She also teaches a number of comparative global studies courses, which sound fascinating and very germane to what we do at Primary Source, including a course on democratization in world politics, and also Women in World Politics, a course which looks at global perspectives on women's issues and women's movement movements around the world. Amy's research focus and her enduring interests have centered on um, issues of uh, comparative politics, activism, and, social, and civil society, and also gender politics um, and um, the in uh, and, and the sex trade, uh, sex trafficking, and gender violence has been an area of particular research for her. So, um, Amy, I think that we are are ready to hand the. Um, to hand the mic over to you and to hand the clicker over to you so you can advance the slides. And we are really looking forward to hearing your presentation. We'll follow that up with our question and answer session with our participants. And then I'll finish out with a few resources connected with the topic for this evening. Great, okay. thank you so much, Susan. That was a very nice introduction. I really appreciate the invitation to speak to everyone this evening. I think that we can wrap up before the basketball game is on. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> we'll all keep that in mind as we get into this material. Um, as Susan mentioned, I am a political scientist, so if things get too jargony, uh, feel free to ask me for clarification during Q&A because we are prone to that in this discipline. Um, so I will try my best. Um, so I want to, um, again, thank everyone for giving me some of your listening power and time this evening. I wanted to first share with you the goals and objectives of my presentation tonight. I'm gonna mostly be focusing on how civil society, which I'll define in a moment, supports democracy and democratization. And I'm going to have a special focus on civil society advocacy and policy influence because that is one of many roles that civil society can play in a democracy, but it's one that's been of particular interest to me uh, for some time now. And then we're gonna drill a little bit more deeply and look at children's rights as a policy issue area. I figured as educators who work with children and teens on a daily basis that you might be interested in the rights and well-being of children in Latin America, which is a, an interesting issue area. So why talk about these themes? Uh, well, for starters, these are uh, passions of mine, and these are my main areas of expertise in recent years, so that's one reason. Beyond that, though, I really like looking at civil society and advocacy in particular because it is uh, what we call agency privileging, which means it's people making a difference. And when you study politics, I think you can focus an awful lot on how politics affects people, sort of what politics does to people, right? Human rights violations and conflict, et cetera. And it's nice to step back and also see that people make politics, people do politics, and people make change in this world. And that, to me, uh, 
is something worth discussing with all of our students and with one another is, is how we can be the change that we want to see in the world, right? To paraphrase um, Gandhi, that's often attributed to Gandhi, that quotation. So it's an opportunity for me to highlight that agency privileging approach to politics. It also, and this is important for me as well as a Latin American specialist, it's an opportunity for me to highlight how Latin America has become a site of innovation, of policy innovation and progress in recent years. Now that's not always the perception that folks have of the region, but it's something that I like to remind my students of when we look at interesting policy reforms that are coming out of the region. So to begin, I've been asked to kind of set the stage of change, um, political change in recent years. And so the first thing I wanted to show you all is how democracy has expanded around the globe. So before we get into the particulars of Latin America, I wanted to show you how the number of democracies has increased during this so-called third wave of democratization. That of course is Samuel Huntington's term. And that third wave happened roughly in the years noted on the slide and the kind of the mid to late 1970s, the 1980s and continued on until the early 2000s. And it washed over most of the world's regions during that time frame. This graphic um, goes a little bit further and it, it distinguishes between electoral and liberal democracies in the world. And we're not going to get too in the weeds with those definitions, but suffice to say that electoral democracies are ones where you do have competitive elections and you have universal suffrage, right? So leaders are elected and come to power through elections. Whereas liberal democracies uh, set the bar quite a bit higher and expect civil liberties to be respected and protected. So your basic human rights are, are uh, protected in those kinds of democracies. There are fewer of those uh, than there are electoral democracies, but the expansion of democracy is very clear from that graphic. Moving on to our region of focus this evening, Latin America, you also see a dramatic expansion of democracy during the third wave. Much of the region experienced a transition from authoritarian regimes to democracy during the years noted in the slide. Uh, this particular index provides a measure of a nation's level of democracy that ranges from negative 10, which is kind of a complete dictatorship, to uh, 10 for a complete democracy. There are lots of ways to measure these, but this draws from a different database uh, on democracy that some folks are using, which is the polity database. So you see here the advance of democracy over time. Military dictatorships had, of course, dominated much of the region in the 1970s and 1980s. And one of the reasons why scholars were so captivated by the third wave of democratization was precisely because of the really uh, grave human rights violations that had been committed in places like Latin America, particularly in the Southern Cone dictatorships, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Brazil. And so there was a lot of um, cautious optimism when those military dictatorships, which had again been the site of really severe human rights uh, violations such as forcible disappearances and detention, torture, summary executions, etc. When those started to transition to democracies, it, it got the attention of scholars who then wanted to explain how this dramatic change had occurred. So that is important for setting our political stage. I also wanted to mention another uh, change that happened in the 2000s, roughly, the, the late 1990s and early 2000s, which is the so-called pink tide, or the left turn, if you prefer that metaphor. <laughs> and here you see the slide uh, chooses to um, look at the pink, the different shades of pink uh, that we see in the region. And that simply meant that you had left-leaning leaders who were elected to the executive branch in these 
democratizing countries. And so it was kind of a, it, here you have these different distinctions between pragmatic or moderate left versus uh, more maybe radical left that we see in some of the countries. Um, Venezuela is a good example of a populist left government, a more radically uh, leftist turn there um, with the election of Hugo Chavez. So Chavez kind of kickstarts this pink tide in 1998. And the ongoing Venezuelan crisis is not the focus of my presentation this evening. I wanted to clarify that, though it certainly is in our thoughts and it has been given lots of media coverage of late. But one of the reasons why it is not the focus of my remarks this evening is because it's what we would call a confounding case, actually, in social sciences. And by that, I mean, it bucks all the trends we're going to be discussing with one another. It goes against the patterns that I'm going to be trying to lay out about democratization and the advance of democracy and the better human rights records in the region that we were just talking about, it goes precisely in the opposite direction where you have a consolidated democracy that had been a stable democracy all the way back in the 1950s and 60s. It did not succumb to authoritarian rule. It did not fall in the hands of military dictators during the period of the 60s and 70s, as was the case elsewhere, precisely the opposite. But in recent years, with populism under Chavez, we see the deconsolidation of democracy in Venezuela. And that has been a sad, sad uh, pattern to witness, to be sure. So a case of consolidated democracy breaking down is a very, very important one. Um, and we can certainly discuss some of the the dynamics involved there during Q&A, if any of you are interested. But as I mentioned, Chavez did kick off the pink tide in 1998. But as you can see, that spread across the region. So we had um, center left leaders called the Concertacion in Chile from 2000 onward, except for a brief um, pause from 2010 to 2014 when a center right leader was elected. We have uh, President Lula in Brazil, who was elected in 2003, followed by Dilma Rousseff. We have the Kirchners um, in Argentina. I'll be mentioning them a little bit later on, uh, 2003 onward. We have the Broad Front in Uruguay, 2005. We have Evo Morales in Bolivia, 2005 as well, and Correa in Ecuador in 2006. So that's a mouthful. <laughs> But those are some of the left-leaning leaders. They're a diverse bunch, to be sure. But what I think distinguishes some of these left-leaning leaders is that they did try to implement social policies that were intended to alleviate poverty and close the class gap. There's, there's always been a lot of inequality, income inequality in this region. They tried to work on that. They tended to boost social spending on education, health, and other areas while they were in office. And in very general terms, they were interested in using the state, right, the power, the resources of the state to address social problems and to invest in, in human capital and development. This will become relevant a little bit later when we talk about activists, advocates, who interacted with these governments they found that there was a window of opportunity that was opening for them, a space where they could work on policies that favored the rights and well-being of children. So that is why it is relevant to what we'll talk about. As you can see from this next slide, though, the pink tide did recede. And so this is not completely up to date, but this uh, captures politics as they stood in fall of 2016. And so you can see already at this time that more right-leaning or more conservative leaders had been elected. So there had been a correction at the polls, right? When voters went to vote, they decided to give center-right and more rightist leaders a shot. So of the 15 or so countries that had formerly been labeled as pink tide countries, there were just eight remaining during this moment. For instance, in Argentina, which we'll focus on, you can see Macri was uh, 
elected, and he was considered a kind of a business-friendly conservative. Um, so he was correcting the, the Kirchner era. More recently in Brazil, as many of you I'm sure already know, uh, Bolsonaro was elected and he would be considered an even kind of further right, right, a kind of harder right wing candidate, uh, very pro-military, something of an apologist for the military dictatorship in Brazil and has uh, caused quite a quite a stir and a, quite a, a, a number of controversial remarks have been made. So we can also discuss him during Q&A if anyone has an, a particular interest in Brazilian politics. So just some reflections in terms of, again, kind of setting the political context for looking at civil society in the region that for about two centuries, Latin America, uh, the, right, the right wing forces in Latin America were deeply suspicious of democratic institutions. They often conspired to overthrow those very institutions, again, leading to things like military seizures of power. But nowadays, the right has evolved, right? They've become much more accepting of democracy since the third wave of democratization and the end of the Cold War. And this is great news for the region, right? Regardless of your personal political beliefs, you have to agree that having a right wing that abides by the democratic rules of the game is a really positive development. Likewise, on the far left, there used to be a lot of disregard, right? And a complete disrespect for democracy as a regime type. If you were on the far, far left, that meant that you were, you know, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, right? That you were going to shoot your way into power and have a full on socialist revolution. So the fact that the right and the left have both moderated and have both accepted democracy, they've accepted the outcome of elections and they can peacefully alternate in power. This is great news for this region. And so all of this points in the direction of democratization, having those electoral choices, having partisan alternatives, having a peaceful alternation of power, this gives people cause for optimism. Susan, a few moments ago, did mention that I'm interested in gender and politics, so please forgive me, I could not help but throw a little bit of, of women in parliament um, your way, because this is another reason for cautious optimism in this region. Women in politics, um, women's representation has grown dramatically in recent years. So again, this is a third wave phenomenon and a very important one. This slide, I, I see it's, it's quite dense, but the main takeaway to notice from this particular slide is that we do have more women in parliament and the reason why we have more women in parliament, there are a myriad of reasons, but one of the main ones is that they have implemented gender quotas in Latin America. And they are surprisingly commonplace and sort of uncontroversial. Affirmative action is typically thought of as a rather controversial policy reform. But in this context, uh, policies like gender quotas have been adopted across the region. There are a few outliers, but for the most part, um, the most countries have spent years um, passing these laws and then improving them, tightening them up, and their goal is to have 50-50. Now, we don't know if they'll achieve that goal, but they're raising the threshold so that 50% of their congressional or parliamentary bodies would be women. So this is really a huge sea change in the region. And it started back in 1991. So very early on in the third wave of democratization, Argentina was a forerunner and 11 Latin American countries quickly followed suit in the 1990s. So the increased representation of women in the region's parliaments and in the executive branches, because there have been women presidents as well. We won't go there, but <laughs> suffice to say that the United States is actually the outlier in the Americas as far as our, up until now, our uh, perhaps inability or unwillingness to elect a woman to the executive branch. Um, because in Latin America, they are able and willing to do that. So I think this is at the center of the debate over the character and quality of democracy in the region.
I don't really have time to discuss it this evening, but I did want to also briefly note that the rights of LGBTQ communities have also expanded in recent decades in the region. And I'm happy to share some brief examples dur during Q&A if you're interested. This has been a huge uh, expansion of citizenship rights that has occurred. Um, this did not really happen in the 1990s. This has been more recent, but the region outpaces some of its neighbors as far as these advances, and they are very meaningful ones. So at this point, we're going to begin talking more about civil society. We could talk about all of the different facets of democracy all evening, but civil society is of course our main theme. So I'd like us to discuss what civil society is and how it supports democracy. To do that, we need to define civil society as an arena. And scholars typically have defined civil society as this arena of self-organized voluntary associational life that is distinguishable from other things, other concepts like the state. It's not supposed to be the same thing as the state. It's not supposed to be the same thing as political society or parties, right? Elected officials who run for office, candidates. It's supposed to be distinct from that. This arena is supposed to be comprised of all of the organizations that make it up. And these, they're very diverse, as you can see from the list here on the slide. They include labor unions, they include professional associations, they include um, territorial-based organizations like neighborhood associations. They include an endless variety of other identity-based and issue-oriented kinds of organizations. So I have a couple of examples on the slide. They're like the Sierra Club, which is an environmental organization, of course. And of course, Save the Children, which is a children's rights organization. Uh, women's groups, it's really, it's really endless, the kinds of groups that can comprise this sphere. So using this definition of civil society that I've provided, we would like to ask you to think very carefully about your own past experiences. What sorts of civil society organizations have you participated in at one time or another? And what motivated you to participate in those? Did you join or create organizations because you saw some need? Why did you get involved in this sphere? And I invite you to log your answers into the chat box and we'll we'll compile them and look at them and that can be part of the the record of this this session so if you can take a moment to think that through that would be wonderful don't i, I say thank you amy for introducing that i was going to say to, um don't write uh don't write a the story of your life but <laughs> or an autobiography of your life as a in civil society but a couple of words to to describe your involvement would be great that would be so interesting um and and um i love that invitation so thank you for that amy um amy while while folks are taking a moment to um to put in some thoughts on that question may i just um throw out a question for you that pertains to the first part of your presentation and it, it really um, is a good juncture here to bring it in because it um, it's not really germane to the civil society question as much but I wanted to ask you a big a big picture question about global politics and global democratization and um, and your the portrait you've painted of of um, Latin American democracy so um, you know people talk sometimes in the in um, in the press about um, a worldwide worldwide wave of democracy or they talk about a worldwide wave of anti-democracy or authoritarianism sweeping the, the globe and such and I'm curious to know how much, how meaningful you actually think it is I mean, does it is it in fact significant to people in um, Ecuador does it have 
influence or um, are they part of the same pattern when um, you know f uh, when there's a move in Phil the Philippines or Hungary toward um, a right-wing nationalist government is that really comparable to such a move in um, within the region of, of Central uh, or South America or um, or does it really make more sense to think regionally and think about influences within a region. I, I just wonder what you think about that. That's a, a wonderful question. And I do think that traditionally Latin Americanists have tended to look at the region and even subregions within the region. And so while we can talk about these global trends in democratization, I think that most of us tend to look uh, more at the region for a, a lot of reasons, but one has to do with the fact that the region does have a Pan-American identity that is very strong, and nowadays it is quite centered on democracy and human rights and protecting the advances of that third wave. And so you have the Organization of American States, um, you have other kind of regional bodies that that stand ready to defend democracy if the need should arise. And whether or not they've done a great job doing that, um, of course, there we could do some further analysis of that, particularly with the, the ongoing crisis in Venezuela as, a, as an important test case. But I do think that they have a kind of a shared imagined community of, of Latin American democracies now that is very strong. Now, that doesn't mean that they would not be interested in global trends, certainly. And um, it's it's interesting that you talk a little bit about the rise of right-wing populism in parts of Europe and elsewhere, because, of course, they would be um, interested in some of those other trends. I think populism generally has been situated more on the left in the region. So some of those right-wing populist experiments um, that are being tried in different in different parts of Europe um, would look kind of familiar as far as the um, the broad outlines of what that would look like, the kinds of appeals to ordinary citizens and some of the discourse and rhetoric of populism would sound similar or reminiscent. But the, the populist experiments in the region have so often been on the left that it, yes, they also would look really different. And so some of the kind of... Um, xenophobic or anti-migrant, uh, some of those discourses that we kind of have associated with contemporary right-leaning populists um, would be um, different from what Latin Americans have experienced. And in a way, that's a good thing, right? I, I don't think that they would necessarily, a lot of Latin Americans would probably not be persuaded by such things because they don't, they're, they're just not experiencing the same pressures, social and, and other press, pressures as we see in parts of Europe on that front. Um, and so it's, it's different. Um, but that being said, a lot of scholars are wringing their hands about a perceived decline in democratization around the globe. And some have even gone so far as to suggest that the third wave ended a long time ago and that we're in some other something. We don't really know what to call it yet, but there's clearly a, a post third wave decline of mm -hmm. democracy. And that has a lot to do with sort of hybrid uh, regimes like Russia and, you know, very important countries that sort of seem to be democratizing and then took a major step back um, in recent years and no longer sort of qualify fully as as democracies. Great. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. That's a, that's nuanced. There's to some extent to, um, we can think about worldwide trends, and then on the other hand, culture and history, in a in a, a more um, contained regional or, or national mode, are are also really important forces, and and maybe in 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 depending on the question you're asking, maybe more relevant than than to look at the wider trends. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. We.
We got super interesting answers to your question. I've never asked um, a group of teachers a question before about civil society and really intriguing. And um, I'll tell you a few things that I can't even relate them all because people had great ideas to say about it. We've also got some questions about the def definitions of civil society. So someone um, thoughtfully writes um, that she's active in Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Um, mm -hmm driven by um, the motive of have, being a mother of, of, of um, a young men and also losing a family member um, to a drunk driver. So that was important. Um, right to life, the right to life movement is, is a, an area of activity. Um, another teacher has written that they um, are involved in, do a lot of community service through Catholic charities, through an organization called Cradles to Crayons, um, community servings. Um, someone asks, are religious based and faith-based organizations considered part of civil society um, or are they a different category? Um, the, and we have people who've mentioned um, faith groups to the liber liberation theology movement. Um, someone else writes, um, Josh writes, my, we donate to organizations such as World Wildlife Fund, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, NAACP um, is donating um, to these organizations because of our, um, our strong social and political beliefs at which they champion. Um, so that was a great answer. Teachers Union, um, as a, another teacher mentions, WGBH, Girl Scouts, all sorts of interesting um, answers and, and groups. So there you go. There's a little survey of our participants. I love it. That's that marvelous. Yeah. Yes, that's marvelous. And just to quickly follow up, um, Yes, those all count. So good job. <laughs> you all get A pluses for the oh, session. Here, so. I have to throw out one more question that sure, I just please. noticed here, which is a great question too. Catherine asks, would organizations that come from multiple countries be considered parts of civil society, sort of transnational organizations? What a great question that is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so um, definitely. Um, each of these can be sort of its own category of civil society activity, uh, charitable, uh, giving, service, community organizations, more at the grassroots. If you volunteer, right, you give of your time in that way. That counts. Faith-based organizations very much count. As part of my research, I've liaised a um, number of times with those organizations. Um, Sometimes people don't necessarily think of uh, fraternal uh, organizations, but I always push my students when I ask them this question, you know, if they are in a fraternity or sorority, that also can count. Scouts and even just, you know, bird watching clubs and hiking club and running club and whatever other club. I mean, all of these things count. It's a very expansive sphere. And yes, international civil society now exists, global civil society. And so a lot of people look at international NGOs or non-governmental organizations. Um, and to the question about what if you just send a check? Well, my goodness, think of all the very important membership organizations uh, that we have interest groups like the National Rifle Association or the Association for um, you know, uh, retired folks and all of these kinds of uh, organizations rely very heavily on members, but they don't necessarily ask you to do a lot of activities unless you want to. And so, yes, those those all count as well. Well, thank you. That's, that's very, very helpful um, for me to get a sense of, of the audience. So at this point, we should move on to how civil society can help in a democracy, how it supports democracy and democratic consolidation, which is just simply um, strengthening democracy so that it lasts, right? Democracy becomes the only game in town, so to speak. No other regime type is preferable to democracy. So there are a lot of roles. This is These are just four quick examples, um, but civil society is known to play a watchdog or a monitoring role. In other words, monitoring the state, monitoring state officials, monitoring um, police officers, um, monitoring elected officials, making sure they aren't engaging in corruption, that sort of thing. We'll be talking about advocacy in a moment and policy influence. Civil society is also known to be a source of fresh political leadership. It's very common. 
that uh, you see new presidents or new members of Congress who have kind of cut their teeth in the sphere of civil society. Maybe they've been the head of a union like, like Lula was in Brazil. Maybe they headed up an important social movement. And then finally, um, a source of social capital and civicness. This is uh, a huge literature that we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but it essentially looks at the kinds of values that seem to be generated and and that grow within civil society organizing. Norms of interpersonal trust, learning how to get along with people who aren't just like you, right? Learning to work in a, in a diverse community, learning the, the sort of how to be reciprocal, right, with other people. These are all supposed to be things that we get out of joining groups and coming face to face with other people in civil society that we wouldn't get if we just always were, you know, on our phones or um, playing video games or doing things in a, in a solitary way. So those are some of the roles that we tend to look at if we take civil society very seriously. Tonight, we're focusing in on advocacy, which means that civil society is interested in trying to make a difference in the policy sphere. So these are a couple of definitions I'll share with you. I like this idea of um, civil society actors making their preferences known, they're articulating their positions or sets of demands, but they don't necessarily get what they want, right? <laughs> you, you can try your best to communicate your preferences and your values and your policy demands and your proposals to elected officials and government officials, but there's so many other inputs that go into the policy making process that you rarely get precisely what you asked for or what you're wanting. So advocacy is just that process of of being involved, trying to communicate those preferences, and you may or may not get what you want out of the deal. I also like in the, the top most definition there, the emphasis on citizenship rights and the public interest in justice. And part of that obviously is just my own bias. I would rather look at civil society organizations that are trying to expand and advance citizenship rights. Um, but so much of civil society is precisely about those 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 issue areas and children's rights obviously falls into that. So again, I'm just sharing with you my own bias in favor of those kinds of groups. So this I hope you can read all right. This is taken from an article of mine from a few years back and it shows some tasks that civil society organizations perform when they engage in advocacy. And it shows you um, just then the sheer number and diversity of tasks that these, these organizations perform during different phases of policymaking. And also some of them are direct and some of them are indirect. So some involve meeting face-to-face -face with elected officials, right? Getting that meeting, sitting at the table um, and, and working out and hashing out policy details. But others are much more indirect. It could be just raising public awareness of your issue. Um, it could be uh, taking your own personal experience, as one of our participants this evening mentioned, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, right? Taking something that you maybe were directly affected by or your family was directly affected by and trying to educate others about that issue, try to make a difference. It takes something that was personal and, and turn it into something quite public and collective in scope. So these are just, again, um, a few a few things that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes when we do our kind of mini, mini case study on children's rights, but I wanted you to see it in table form as well. And I'm going to show briefly this image, and then we'll go back to the table as I discuss children's rights in Argentina. But a spotlight on Argentina just allows us to go in a little bit more deeply into a, a specific context. And here you see children actually uh, marching and you know saying that we're um, we're involved we are in possession of our own rights and so this is very common in the region it's just fascinating you have so many adolescents and and younger children 
who actually get involved in civil society themselves. They don't just wait for grown-ups to speak on their behalf. They mobilize and they speak out on their own behalf. It's really interesting. You have children's labor unions in the region um, in great numbers, and you have other kinds of, of groups that are comprised predominantly of children. So I find that just endlessly fascinating. And so I have a new book that will actually come out this summer called The Youngest Citizens, Children's Rights in Latin America. And so in that book, I talk a little bit about this, uh, this effort across the region to think about children's rights. And in Argentina, you'll recall I mentioned a little bit ago that the military dictatorships in the region and particularly in the Southern Cone were known for their really grave human rights violations. Argentina also had this notoriety back in uh, the dictatorship period of 1976 to 1983. Nowadays, human rights discourse as a result of those experiences is really strong. It really can't be overstated. Argentina, once it had its democratic transition, had this really long experience with human rights organizing. And so human rights has become a kind of a master frame in Argentina. And so children's rights in some ways can just build on this, right? This legacy of decades of human rights mobilization, right? Think of the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, other human rights organizations. And children's rights activists were able to build on and extend the conception of rights in Argentina. And so that is something that I also find really interesting about this particular uh, context. So I'd like to go back, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. There we go, back to the table and think a little bit about what the children's rights advocates did to further their own cause. And I first wanted to mention that the Latin American countries ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and that convention had been adopted in 1989 in the United Nations. And this was a really important development for the region because the convention identifies children as rights-bearing subjects and entitles them to certain rights guaranteeing their protection and care. So examples would include the right to participate in the community, freedom of expression, the right to health, education, recreation, your own identity, protection from exploitation, discrimination, abuse, neglect, etc. In Argentina, the convention has been so influential. It's very popular. It has a lot of legitimacy. So during the 1990s and early 2000s, child advocates in Argentina became influential as well. They pushed for policy reforms. And one of the reasons why they felt compelled to do so was that a lot of the children's um, policies, the policies that were relevant to children, like the juvenile justice system, for example, were extremely antiquated. And so one of the laws that was in effect during this time dated back to 1919. So the, the early years of the 20th century, it's called the guardianship of minors law. And it was, I'm sorry to say, a source of utter embarrassment in Argentina. It was a law that was designed to protect children at risk, and it was based on the doctrine of the irregular situation, in quotation marks, which applied to young people who had committed criminal offenses, but also applied to young people who had been abused or neglected or abandoned or who were economically disadvantaged. And so it basically took children who were, you know, maybe being raised in, in impoverished families, marginalized families, and it said that they had been morally abandoned. And in such instances, family courts could assert, assert the state's right to assume legal guardianship of those children. Young kids were then removed from their families and housed in institutions. So this is an extremely paternalistic view of children, right? They're sort of 
property of their parents. And then if the parents mess up, they become property of the state. And judges can sort of expropriate this property when they consider it necessary. Then children are taken to these facilities, these institutions, which were overcrowded. They were lacking in educational opportunities, which you all can appreciate, of course. They were lacking in privacy. They were basically contrary to any notion we would have of child development. And so in interviews with activists that I've done over the years, they refer to these institutions as prisons. One activist I interviewed said that a child was just a number in the eyes of the state. And after entering the bureaucratic maze of these institutions and the system, young people would never find their way back out, the activist said. There was also a lot of concern about other institutionalized forms of abuse and violence that affected children and teens and youth. For instance, policing. There's a, a Spanish phrase some of you may be familiar with called gatillo facil, which kind of means to be trigger happy, right? When police officers shoot first, ask questions later, you have excessive force that is used, particularly in poor and working class neighborhoods of urban centers in Latin America. And so because youth and particularly young adults, but also teens were being killed in encounters with the police, this also made children's rights a more urgent issue in these new democracies. And so activists offered these really devastating critiques of the country's juvenile justice system and these institutions, these facilities, these, these shootouts, all of these things created uh, an opportunity, I guess, for activists to say, okay, you have this convention on the rights of the child on the one hand, and Argentina has ratified it, so it's supposed to be in effect. It's not just a piece of parchment. It should be made real. And so they set about making sure that they prepared reports, did research, talked to officials in the United Nations, and did everything in their power to call for better policies. And so they were really effective at garnering media attention. So some of the things that are on the table here, just producing position papers and authoring actual proposals that they could then send to elected officials and try to get passed. Um, they did a lot of training of um, folks such as yourselves, um, teachers, especially in the public school system. They said, look, let, let us teach you about the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Better yet, let's teach the children about the fact that they have rights. They are rights-bearing subjects, right? I oftentimes joke I have an eight and a 10-year-old, and I made the mistake early on in my parenting of sharing with them that they are rights-bearing individuals who have rights. And that, that changed dynamics in my family <laughs> quite a bit <laughs> when they then started to uh, make demands based on their own agency and uh, rights. But at any rate, the activists spent nearly a decade advocating for child protection laws that they could be proud of, that they would no longer be embarrassed about. And so they worked directly with policymakers and government officials on those, those changes. So child advocates really extended that human rights discourse that was so strong in Argentina. They expanded the category of rights bearing subjects to include Argentina's youngest inhabitants and meanwhile, they also invoked the global childhood regime that the convention had created, which was very different from anything that had ever come before it. And so all of that culminated in this massive mobilization in 2004 and 2005. And by 2005, you have a new law, a new child protection law that passes through Congress. Um, you have landmark reform that recognizes children as rights-bearing individuals. Economic hardship is no longer a valid reason to take a child away from his or her family to institutionalize that child. And judges are only supposed to intervene in the most exceptional of cases. 
So this was a huge um, achievement of civil society, but of course they did not act alone. And so I'd like to briefly remind you of our, our pink tide, our left turn discussion from earlier this evening. Members of the Kirchner administration, it was Nestor Kirchner, they were very eager to implement the convention. And so they were on board with civil societal actors. And so that is a good case of the pink tide actually having a policy consequence, right? That they were interested in alleviating poverty, including child poverty. They were interested in providing more social services and investing more resources and taxpayer dollars into these, these social policies. Uh, the Kirchners also had a connection to Peronism, which those of you who are good at history will remember is also a very uniquely Argentine movement that was populist and tried to position itself as an ally of poor and working class Argentines, unions, workers, unemployed workers, various other social actors. And so Kirchnerismo, though it could not be the same as Peronism, it was a completely different era of, of history, they still wanted to sort of resurrect some of the aspects of that by seeing to these reforms. So child protection reforms might not have happened if not for the presence of the Kirchner's um, first Nestor and then his wife and a former Senator, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, followed him in office. So the pink tide was indeed a factor in this instance. So I think our time is getting short. So I just would like to wrap up that this particular policy journey ended happily. It took activists to a really good place. Again, a lot of policy advocates don't get what they wanted. In this case, they did. But just the fact that they were so influential in the process of crafting and getting the policy passed is, I think, notable. Uh, the new law does, in fact, strengthen children's rights considerably. And child advocates also just transform the public discourse surrounding childhood and what childhood even means. And I think this case and others like it help illustrate how civil society supports democracy and democratization. So let me briefly recap what I mean. Mm -hmm. For one thing, civil society, you know, again, engages in policy advocacy and tries to influence policy, and that's important in and of itself. Secondly, as I mentioned at the outset, I like to constantly underscore that Latin America has been a site of policy reform and innovation. And I think that the children's rights movement is, again, a microcosm of that. It's not the only uh, innovative kind of policy that's been passed, but it certainly counts as that. And also, I like to remind my students and my colleagues that Latin America has also been a site of the expansion of citizenship rights in meaningful ways. And so I also like this case because it challenges us to think about who, who citizens are, who counts as a citizen. Uh, young people typically are not considered citizens because they're not old enough to vote, but that's a very narrow definition, I think, of citizenship. And so I like, I like to think about what it means to expand citizenship rights and how civil society plays a role in doing that work because human rights are very intimately bound up with democracy. So when civil society tries to advance the rights of groups or individuals, especially previously marginalized or excluded communities, I think this is really important work. Latin Americans are really, really skilled at doing this. I just really never get tired of looking at activism and advocacy and social movements because they are extremely effective in, in the region. So I think in conclusion that all of these themes teach us something about the quality of democracy, the character of democracy in this region. Thank you so much for listening. You've been very attentive and I very much look forward to your, your questions and, and, uh, and comments at this point.
Oh, marvelous. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a lovely talk. And um, I think we can, here we can put our cameras on so we can see, we can see you and we can see one another. Um, no. Thank you. That was marvelous. We it's so interesting and and um, such a great case study. I think for making that um, really compelling point that you wanted to make about innovation um, and uh, and sources of innovation from the grassroots up. And that was really really marvelous. We have some great questions coming in already. And. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll share them with you. And I want to, but I want to also remind um, our participants that um, Amy's open for questions. So go ahead and type them into the question box if there's something that you would like to um, talk about. And for the meanwhile, to get us started, um, Catherine was was intrigued by the as I was by the case study about um, children's rights, and she wondered whether you see. Um, a, in parallels that are interesting between the um, kinds of children's institutions that were in place um, prior to this reform and the um, Indian schools, the schools in the US and Canada that have been coming to light and have been gaining attention in recent years. I don't know if you're familiar with that at any level of detail. Um, not particularly, actually, in the context of the U.S. Um, can you give me more of a sense of what kind of schools? I guess the Indian boarding schools where oh. indigenous, the indigenous children were um, taken from families in Canada. Yeah, it's okay. an interesting area yeah. for, for further examination. Yeah, yeah. I, I did see, a, um, or maybe it was I heard, I can't remember, it might have been an NPR report about... Um, adoption to sort of um, that mm. the more we learn about um, native communities the more we're discovering that there were um, some kind of illicit adoptions and things done in the past this idea that um, children should be raised in other families that would be superior to their own right I think would be one one important tie-in um, in Argentina these institutions, um, again, have a, a really bad reputation um, because the children are taken away from their family structure and they're not really given, um, they, they lose the love of their, their families, but they also kind of lose their identity in the process. And mm -hmm. the institutions were not known to, again, provide a lot of educational opportunities or, mm -hmm. um, other other just basic um, needs that children have and so that is why the activists particularly kind of seized upon those institutions and wanted to undo them now at the beginning of the 2000s you still did have some of these particularly in greater buenos aires where there was a the largest concentration of these kinds of institutionalized children so you still had something like 19,000 give or take children who continue to be housed in these. And so their you know, job number one was to get these um, closed and come up with alternatives to them. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good question um, yeah, in terms yeah. of global parallels. Yeah. yeah, it would be an interesting one for student research too, I think. Yes, um, indeed. Yeah, and we appreciate your choosing children's rights as a as a theme because it, it is of such great interest to educators and mm -hmm. and, and our students too. Um, so another one of the educators with us tonight, uh, Gabriel, is wanting to to push back a, a bit on the on the um, maybe maybe it's a glass half full, glass half empty sort of interpretive question, but he has given a number of examples of um, of right wing leaders, um, mm -hmm. Bo Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, others that are not um, as familiar to me too, but uh, a list of several different names. Um, he mentioned Sebastian Pinera in Chile, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, a figure in Colombia, Marquez, Ivan Marquez. So could you, um, I guess the question is, uh, is it really, um, you know, given that there's this phenomenon too, is it is it um, valid to say um, so assertively that democracy is sort of healthy and flourishing in the region, or is it a, actually a more mixed picture? 
Mm -hmm. No, that is definitely a fair question. And I think that it depends on um, the quality and character of the, the right-leaning leaders. And so um, as, it, as it was the case on the left, you know, we've, we've had left-leaning leaders that kind of um, jeopardized democracy, again, that Chavismo being the main example of that, Maduro took it to whole new heights or depths, <laughs> maybe is the better word. Yeah. Um, but there's diversity on the left. And likewise, on the right, we see a diversity of approaches. And so there have been right-leaning leaders who were much more kind of moderate and pragmatic, and then we have um, leaders. I, I I am concerned about Bolsonaro. Um, I am I do I do share that concern. It's a little bit early to tell because this is very very recent and ongoing. But I I think that someone who defends the military dictatorship in Brazil and who lauds and you know remembers fondly that era of Brazilian history. I I do. I'm very concerned by that. This is very this is different than some of the the kinds of right leaning leaders that we've seen in the region that conform more to how I describe them. And so that is a problem. Um, he, you know, has done really strange things. I don't know if it's just to get a rise out of people. I I'm not really. I don't really fully understand, but for instance, one illustration is that when Bolsonaro, uh, before he was elected president, he was a member of Congress and he voted to impeach Dilma Rousseff when she was brought down in impeachment proceedings and a corruption scandal, et cetera, um, that touched on almost all of political society in Brazil, not just the Workers Party. It was much broader scope than that. But anyway, when he cast his vote in favor of impeaching uh, Rousseff, he paid homage to a colonel who had been involved in Brazil's military dictatorship. And he announced that he was dedicating his pro-impeachment vote to the memory of this person who had tortured Dilma Rousseff, had actually been in the torture chamber during the dictatorship um, when all of, again, these very severe human rights violations had occurred during that wow. era. And so, yes, this, yeah. this gets our attention to be sure, absolutely. Yeah. To bring it back to civil society briefly, I also do have concerns about some of the leaders who go out of their way to threaten civil society organizations, not all of them. But in the case of Bolsonaro, he has, since the campaign season, and, and then once he was elected, he said, you know, you're on notice, all of you environmental movement activists, um, LBGTQ community activists, Afro-Brazilian uh, communities are very strong. There are so many forms that they take in civil society in Brazil. Um, and he, he put them all on notice, and there were actual attacks. There were violent attacks against Afro-Brazilians mm -hmm. and just citizens, right, um, murdered in broad daylight by people who apparently were emboldened by these threats. And so I, I, I think Bolsonaro is um, especially worrisome for all of these reasons, um, and, and both in terms of civil society and democracy and where they intersect. So I do think we have to look at that very, very, very carefully. Um, also, that's not even to go into his uh, animosity toward um, gender equality, women. He's, I mean, he's he has made very homophobic comments, um, very ugly things that I don't even like to repeat. When my students ask me, I'm like, do I really have to go over this? Because to say the words out loud just feels harmful. It's, mm -hmm. it's ugly and harmful and hateful. Hate speech is what it is. And so, yes, I'm very concerned about him. Piñera in Chile, eh, right, more center, more center right mm -hmm. and didn't didn't have these same um, mm -hmm. characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So case by case basis and to look at some of the gradations of um, right wing politics, too. Absolutely. Lens. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you um, for that answer. Amy, I wanted to ask you, and you gave us a, um, 
um, a wonderful start to this uh, to this question, answering this question. I think earlier in your in your opening, but um, in case you have anything to add, this would be so helpful to us. I think as as teachers are trying to help um, characterize uh, developments in the region for our students. So when you teach your students about Latin America, um, what are the a couple of main um, big ideas or um, essential understandings that you hope you'll develop. You've mentioned um, already that the, the question of, of seeing um, the agency mm-hmm. and, act- and activism of people in, in the area and then, you know, sort of a writing a misconception by talking about innovation and and um, and creativity and the vibrance of, of um, democratic practice. Are there a couple of other um, big ideas that you underscore or keep in mind that you recommend we be thinking about um, when we're framing questions and themes for studying this mm-hmm. area? I do. Um, so one kind of big theme that comes up when I teach Latin American politics are, is a experimentation, I guess would be the word, that the region has seen these really dramatic shifts back and forth. So in, in a region, um, you know, you, you have so many kinds of political models that have been tried and experimented with, you wouldn't expect to be, see so many and yet there they are. And so you have, of course, I've been talking about democracy and that has stuck for the most part uh, in recent decades. But before that, we did have military dictatorship and the swing was so dramatic because the the countries that broke down, um, many of them had been consolidated democracies like Uruguay and Chile had long and stable periods of democracy and the second wave of democracy. And those were precisely the places where we had this dramatic failure and collapse of democracy. And then the the regime that replaced it was so dramatically different. So that that pendulum shifting right, left, and the collapse of democracy, its breakdown is something that you can analyze in the region. And you also have populism that we've talked about. You have lots of cases of that. Um, again, you have different forms that that is taken, but it's it's another, it, it's a region that is very, um, it, it lends itself to studying those kinds of models. Mm-hmm. You, yeah, so I would say that um, that's something I learned from some of my, um, my mentors when I was in graduate school is to think about this region as having tried out lots of different kinds of of politics. Mm. And those of us who are Democrats, small d Democrats, right? Not Democratic Party Democrats, but people who prefer democracy to the alternatives, Mm -hmm. um, we can take heart that that seems to be um, the, the regime of choice nowadays. But when you look at Latin America, you can't take that for granted either. And you can't presume that 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 would be the only kind of regime type that will be that will be tried there. And so that's one takeaway. Another would be to look at um, institutional uh, innovation. So Mm -hmm. it's not really my area of research expertise. I don't publish on, you know, political parties and I don't publish on what Congress Mm -hmm. looks like or what electoral rules they use and things like that. But it's very interesting to look at institutional innovations and experimentation in these democracies because they they may have presidentialist democracy in Latin America like we have in the United States, but their presidentialist democracies are very different. And so if you have any students who are interested in how democracy actually functions, I think this is a wonderful region to look at just how many parties they have the diversity of parties, the kinds of parties. It's so different from Coke and Pepsi or whatever you want to call it that we have in the States, right? (laughs) Uh Two-party dominant system. And the way they elect presidents is very different. There's no electoral college. Nobody wants to emulate that. Presidentialist democracies around the world want nothing to do with, uh, (laughs) they're like not having one person, one vote. Right, they don't right. have those kinds of, of uh, institutions that mm. change how votes are counted. So I, I would say that if anyone is interested, it's a very rich region to look at how you can take institutions and 
and you can shape your democracy. Again, the gender quotas, other kinds of quotas um, have been implemented, affirmative action policies. So it, it's, it's a place where they have not been afraid, I think, to try new things. Um, one That's last thing, participatory uh, institutions mm. is another huge area of scholarship. And it's really a, an exciting one, you know, to say that, okay, these are representative democracies. They delegate the task right. of governing like we do, but they also have all these participatory things like participatory budgeting in Brazil and, right, all of these ways that citizens are actively involved in their own democracy, which I think is neat. Those are great answers. Thank you again so much. I, we are, as you said, we're pushing up against the basketball game and the end of our, <laughs> end of our session. But let me just um, very quickly give people a, a whirlwind tour here of um, three resource suggestions that I'm leaving you with tonight. And, um, and you can go back and look at them more closely. They're all, they'll all be listed on the, um, they are all listed on our Latin America um, resources Google, Google document, but I just wanted to put these together for you to close out the evening. So in terms of um, thinking about three strategies, three um, reflection points to the, to the talk that Amy gave us tonight um, and how we can connect to the, topic of democracy, democratization and, and governance in teaching and in global studies. Suggestion number one, um, this is a golden opportunity studying democracy to, to think about um, working with media, newspapers, press coverage, um, and um, working in media, critical media analysis and comparative study of news media, which is a great topic. And of course, Journalism and newspapers are part of the civil society sector, very important one too, human rights issues and in, in the protection of or, or violations of the rights of um, journalists. So um, a favorite um, feature from our Latin, from our um, primary source, org resource guides. I've mentioned them a couple of times in our webinar series and I want to go back to it once more. So we do have this Latin America resource guide and here it is with all of its different tabs. And if you go to the last of those tabs on the bottom there, it's something called, which we haven't looked at together, it's called Latin America in the News. And it is um, a wonderful page. It doesn't look like much when you're looking at it right here, but this is an interactive page. It's RSS feed. So every day when you open up this tab, the site is different and it is um, it's streaming um, news reports from um, the Latin American news services and U.S. And, Br and British and European news services too. So your students can very quickly find, um, you can do a great, ex teachers have done great exercises with this comparing how politics and um, social um, change are covered in, uh, in the media in um, Latin America in the region and outside. So that's suggestion number one. Suggestion number two, um, great opportunities for doing student inquiry and flash research research, sort of short-term, small goal research. Um, there's lots of different sites that can help you do this. A favorite one is BBC News um, Country Profiles, and it's very accessible, easy to read material for students, very consistent in the way it's presented. And um, it, you can put them on this page and they can find the country they've been assigned to and quickly find links and um, background information. So that's a good opportunity, but there are other places to do that. And then the last of my suggestions is um, I think reflecting what Amy um, urged us all to think about tonight, learning about politics in the context of culture, social change, daily life, the way people live their lives, so politics rooted in, in the everyday and in, in human community, um, having encouraging your students to read widely when they're studying democracy, democracy and politics in the region um, and the history is to have them read articles about how people are living now and um, a favorite place for me to do that is to go to um, PRI um, Public Radio International's program, The World, and they have a Latin America page that um, collects their uh, in-depth reporting on um, themes of daily life, social change, um, and politics in the region. So those are three favorites um, resources that we hope you'll enjoy going back to. We are going to close out our evening, but Amy, I want to thank you so much for a really, really wonderful talk, very enlightening, wonderful answers to our questions. We'll look forward to working with you again. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you for being with us. And thanks to all of you who've um, joined us for this series. You've been a really wonderful group. And um, we look forward to learning with you in the future. Uh, take care, everyone, and good night. Good night.